Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. So that little fragment that you heard, that was Jesus's, or part of Jesus' first recorded sermon. And it was based, that sermon was based on a text from the prophet Isaiah, which was one of the books, as it is now in our Hebrew scriptures, it was one of the books of Jesus' Bible, too. And this is actually a picture of, of, that, of a, an ancient manuscript, older than Jesus, actually, of what was called the Septuagint. And that is largely what is in our Hebrew scriptures today. And last week, we talked about how the Bible can be used to support almost any perspective, precisely because it was put together with intentional ambiguity. It wasn't an accident that you get all of those different perspectives in the Bible. Those people that put together, actually, it was one person who put together what we have as the Christian, um, Christian scriptures today, included four Gospels knowing full well that they were different from one another. Now, when I was a young Christian, I was taught to revere the Bible differently. I was taught, and it was actually, I found this. This was a, this is my third grade Bible that I was given. I lost it for many years, and somebody found it in the church that I grew up with and, and mailed it to me years ago. But inside it, it, it starts, it's inscribed, all scripture is inspired by God. Those words meant to me that if I noticed the contradictions and I noticed the ambiguity, that it was a lack in my understanding or my ability to kind of put things together because clearly God couldn't mess up. Today, I revere the Bible differently. My, referen my reverence doesn't come from using it as a, an answer to all of humanity's questions, some sort of divine textbook. Today, like I said last week, I look for those core values that I find in the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, there are those ancient stories in Scripture. Last week, we heard the story of Yehu's coup against King Joram and his mother Jezebel. Those stories, they don't mince words. In fact, they are violent and they're gross. It was really gross. And when you experience these stories, even if you don't acknowledge it consciously, somewhere deep down inside yourself, you ask yourself one of two things. This too, I believe about God. Or, this I do not believe about God. And so how could you possibly know if you're right? Is the God that you imagine actually correct just because you think so? Can you force God to fit into some sort of box of your own design? As a Christian... I look to the teachings and, most importantly, those core values that I get from the teaching, the wisdom in Jesus Christ. And that begins with his first sermon. He announces himself to be the one to preach good news to the poor. Not to the elite or the wealthy or the people with money, but to the poor. He proclaims release to the prisoners, restoration of sight to the blind, and liberation for the oppressed. Can you see why the Romans, 
the occupying force might be a little concerned if you've got somebody out who are preaching things like that. Because that's going to get Jesus into trouble. It will. And you start talking in that way. You start talking about, well, liberation of the oppressed. That's going to get somebody upset. But even more, even more than what he says in his sermon, it's what he leaves off of the prophet Isaiah. He stops his quote right in the middle of the line. Here's what the rest of it says. In liberation for prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vengeance for our God. He left off the whole day of vengeance for our God part of that. He just left it off. Now, why? He had the scroll. It says, the story says, he had the scroll right in his hands. He knew what came next. I think that this is his way of saying... This I do not believe about God. How often in Jesus' greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, how often during that sermon does he say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Each time he does that, he is questioning the Bible. I've been taking an online course recently with a, a great scholar, a guy named Richard Rohr. Um, actually, some of you, I, I didn't know about Richard Rohr until about a year ago, and a cu couple of you are the people that introduced me to Richard Rohr. He's a brilliant Franciscan priest, and I recorded this from something that he said in class recently. If you look, and this isn't hard to prove, if you'd give me time, I could do it, that Jesus doesn't equally quote uh, all the scriptures uh, at all. Some he actively disagrees with and opposes. So to say every word of scripture is equally inspired, Jesus doesn't treat it that way. For example, he never quotes the book of Joshua and Judges, which are arguably the most violent books in the Bible. Uh, in the book of Leviticus, which has like 130 thou shalt nots, he, there's one hidden in the middle, thou shalt. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's, to my knowledge, the only time he quotes the book of Leviticus. <laughs> There's a very selective reading in Jesus. That's just honest. And at this point, for Christians not to admit that is culpable dishonesty. Because passages that are punitive, threatening, he just ignores it. I was taught that all scripture, every word, was inspired by God. And for a long time, I would, I would do these mental gymnastics to try to make it all work out, to harmonize it somehow. But I'm coming to see that Jesus didn't really struggle like that. There were parts to the Bible that he just ignored. You know, all that stuff, you see, you would think that if you look at the press sometimes, you'd think that the Bible must be entirely a tract against homosexuality. And yet Jesus doesn't sing a solitary word about it at all. He ignored it. Along with a lot of other outdated rules. Rules that were already outdated in Jesus' day 2,000 years ago. And so I am learning a new way. A Jesus way of approaching my study of the Bible. And I call it my Jesus lens. It's the criteria that I use to evaluate what I believe about God. Not just when I read the Bible, but when I look at life in general. What do I believe? How does this perspective look through a Jesus lens? Can that be perspective be seen through the core values of mercy and justice, of nonviolence? And that one is a tricky one for me, honestly. Inclusivity and compassion. Because that is the God that I worship. This is the God of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that I've discovered any sort of like magic decoder ring. But it, it does not 
reduce Christ's way down to this. This is a sign that's on a billboard in North Dakota where I used to live between Fargo and Bismarck. Because if what you walk out of here today is that all Jesus' teaching can be reduced to this, then I have failed. Because here's the thing. Being nice isn't going to help. It isn't going to bring good news to the billions of people living on this planet in crushing poverty. All the niceness in the world won't feed them. Being nice isn't necessarily going to dismantle the racial system of mass incarceration, which is going on right now, from which prisoners must be set free. Being nice is not the gospel. Because the harsh realities of this world very quickly show that the be nice sentimentality is a false gospel. Now Jesus, he spent so much time preaching inclusivity. He preached it constantly. And he'd actually make his disciples, his followers, angry with him because he always used a foreigner as the hero. Think about it, the good Samaritan, the most faithful Roman centurion, more faithful than anybody in Israel, the Samaritan woman at the well. And so when they came to a Samaritan village one night, they were tired, and they got to this Samaritan village to rest. They were a little put out when these Samaritans rejected them. After all, all that Jesus was doing for them. When the disciples James and John saw how the Samaritans treated Jesus, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to consume them? But Jesus turned and spoke sternly to them, and they went on to another village. Because what Jesus was teaching was this. Whoever isn't an enemy is an ally. Those Samaritans in that village, they were being jerks. They were violating the very basic precepts of hospitality in their day. And all the niceness, all of the niceness of Jesus wasn't going to matter to them. Because there are a lot of jerks and bullies in the world. But the choice to call them an enemy, or even to take that a step further the choice to seek vengeance against them. That choice is up to you. The core values, the principles of Jesus, aren't something you just take up when everything is easy, and it's easy to be nice. In the face of a violent oppressor, the courage to use active nonviolence To take the punch yourself is not easy. It is so much more tempting to return violence for violence. Staying silent when somebody else is saying something that is ripping into the dignity of another person, that might even seem like the polite thing to do. Just don't say anything, don't get involved. And it might, in the short term, even de-escalate that situation. But your silence when somebody's dignity is being taken away does not build justice. In fact, it can even embolden bullies. The core values of Jesus are loving, merciful, and compassionate. But they are not always nice and polite. Know the difference. And that's where the Bible comes in. Throughout these ancient stories, all of those ancient stories contained in the Bible, there are people who are trying to understand the truth, the true nature of God, and for how it meant for them to live. And looking through a Jesus lens, sometimes we look at their stories and say, wow, they really got it right. And other times you look and you say, not so much. But you can only do that if you have a Jesus lens. And that lens comes to us 
from our Bible, which is, of course, different than Jesus' Bible. And it comes to us through God's living Holy Spirit. So I want to challenge you to polish, maybe grind a new one if you need it, but polish your Jesus lens. Make a commitment to yourself over the next few months to read Jesus' teaching, just a little bit, five minutes a day. That's it. You can start with the Gospel of Mark. It's really short. It's really short. Make Jesus' teaching so familiar to you that when I drop phrases like the woman at the well, it connects. You know what I'm talking about. Because here's the thing. Living into the core values of Jesus Christ is not easy, not in a truly messed up world. And even though the Bible may not be the rule book that I, once, I was once taught, viewing it through a Jesus lens is powerful. It's not easy, but it is powerful and it is transformative. Because the wisdom and the light contained in the Bible, you can only get them through exposure to the Bible. And I'm here to help encourage. I use this app that I use for my everyday readings. And um, I love to have Bible pals too. And you can actually friend me in the Bible app. I put the link out on our Facebook site today. Download it. Put it on your phone. Put it on your iPad. Whatever. And friend me. Let's read together. Polish your Jesus, Jesus lens. Because you're going to find passages that give you so much hope. And then you're going to read things that set your teeth on edge. But it'll all help to polish that Jesus lens of knowing those core values, those principles. Because the day is coming, and maybe it's here for you, when the Holy Spirit is going to call on you to act. And she will. And you'll be ready. Will you pray with me? Spirit of Christ, you are alive in the world. You flow through me and you flow through all life. You call people like me to be good news. But we need to know how. We need to know what is true so that we can live in your way and to help heal this world. Push us to know you. Push us to polish our Jesus lens so that we can know your values, your principles and how to use them to live. With hope in you, we pray. Amen.